important notes about online learning. Download the slides and go through them along with the video and audio. You still need to make notes and try and express things in your own words and this is important for your own understanding. You still need to go through your manual and do the work points in preparation for your tutorial session. You still need to explore further through additional reading and online investigation. For instance, YouTube, Wikipedia and the library have wonderful resources for you. While doing online learning, it becomes even more important that you do these things. You will need to manage your own time and take responsibility for your own learning. If you do these things, you'll be well on your way to getting the most out of our course. Enjoy the lecture. Grammar is something that we are all familiar with, mostly because we've been taught about this at school. Why study grammar? On the one hand, a good knowledge of grammar improves our proficiency in a language and may also help us express ourselves more effectively. However, there is another reason to study grammar, and that is because language is the mirror of the mind, and a detailed study of language and its grammar might reveal to us just how the mind works. By the end of this lecture, I would like you to be able to explain what syntax is and how it relates to linguistics, to distinguish between prescriptive and generative grammars, and explain the concept of a generative grammar. You also need to be able to demonstrate the existence of structures in language and identify the grammatical categories to which words belong and apply diagnostic tests to prove their categorization. What exactly is grammar? Take a look at the following sentences, all of which exhibit a supposed ungrammaticality. If you choose the most expensive items, you will be able to serve less people. The more grammatical version would be to say to serve fewer people. We love steak and shake. Her and I eat grilled cheese and chili there. The more grammatical counterpart would be to say, she and I eat grilled cheese. Then she cursed and screamed and told my grandma she didn't want to live no more. The more grammatical version would be to say, live anymore. There's some really bad people there. A more grammatical version of the sentence would be, there are some really bad people there. And I don't know how they do it, but they sure do it good. The more grammatical version of this sentence would be to say, they sure do it well. All of these supposedly ungrammatical sentences express the meaning perfectly. We are all able to understand what they mean. They are also the kinds of sentences that we might expect ordinary people to say on almost any day. And yet they are classified as ungrammatical. I think there are two basic questions that these kinds of examples raise. The first question is, what does it mean for something to be grammatical or ungrammatical? And the second thing is, how do we characterize a grammar? In other words, how do we express a grammar or how do we write it down so that people will understand what we mean? A traditional view of grammar is as a list of Ten Commandments for Language, things that you probably shouldn't do. Traditional grammars are often associated with prescriptive views of language. Prescriptivism and descriptivism are concepts you will learn about in the Languages in Society module. An extract from a traditional grammar might include the following kinds of do's and don'ts. Don't use ain't. Don't start a sentence with a conjunction. Don't end a sentence with a preposition. And don't strand a preposition at the end of a sentence. While this kind of grammar is quite good at telling you what not to do, it isn't really very good at telling you what people actually do in practice. A more descriptive traditional grammar would rather focus on what ordinary people do. For instance, you might say something like 2a, articles precede nouns, or relative clauses follow the noun that they modify, a preposition precedes its object, and prepositional phrases can be placed at the front of the sentence for emphasis. The rules in 1 are prescriptive, whereas those in 2 tend to be descriptive. A prescriptive grammar, then, is how people ought to use the language according to the language mavens or various authorities in the language. A descriptive grammar tells us the way that humans actually use language in ordinary contexts. Descriptivists try and describe how a language is used in its own terms. They would argue that there is no such thing as a common universal grammar or a set of languages that all languages are entirely unique cultural products that relate to the culture of the people who speak them, and that language structure is culturally specific, and that there are no necessary commonalities between languages. One advantage of this approach is that it reminds us that when we are trying to discharacterize the grammars of languages, 
that we ought not to impose our own categorizations on them, but allow the languages to speak for themselves, so to speak. The disadvantage with this view is that it may blind us to the possibility that there may well be certain commonalities between the languages of the world. By the way, the picture on the screen is a still from an article about a book called The Grammar of Happiness by the author Dan Everett, and that is a picture of Dan Everett in the water next to a member of the Piraha tribe from the Amazon where he had gone to study their language. Dan Everett became quite famous, or perhaps infamous, for arguing that the Piraha language had no recursion in it. You will remember the concept of recursion from the very first lecture. If this were true, it would probably be the only human language that did not have recursion. Of course, this is not a problem from the anthropological descriptive perspective, because this perspective aims to characterize each language in its own terms. So if a language doesn't have recursion, well then, that's just the way that language is. Piraha is also interesting because it only has numbers for one and more than one. So if you own three sheep, you would just say, I have many sheep. And if you have 10 sheep, you would say, I have many sheep. It also supposedly only has a present tense, does not have a future tense or a past tense. What was perhaps the most controversial part of Dan Everett's thesis was his attempt to link the language with the culture. So he argued, for instance, that because the language did not have the ability to express a future or past tense, that this meant that the people themselves were not able to make plans in the future, or that they literally did not think of themselves as having, as having a past or a history. I'm not going to commit myself on whether Dan Everett was right or wrong in this supposition, but needless to say, he has been heavily criticized for this approach. Some linguists who criticize Dan Everett's work came from something known as the generative school. They had another way of thinking about grammar. The generativists argue that a grammar is a comprehensive, yet finite and hopefully relatively simple set of rules that characterize an entire system. A grammar should then generate all and only every possible state of that system. Now that is quite abstract, so let's try and make it concrete with the example of the game of snakes and ladders. Let's think about how a prescriptivist might approach the grammar of snakes and ladders. I could imagine prescriptive rules like make sure you throw a six because that'll take you furthest in the game or make sure you don't land on the head of a snake because that will take you further back or make sure that you land on the bottom of a ladder so that you can advance in the game. Unfortunately, those kinds of prescriptive rules might not be all that helpful. In contrast, a generative grammar of the games of snakes and ladders might look like this. Roll a dice, advance the number of squares indicated, obey the rules in each square. If you land on a snake's head, proceed to the tail. If you land it on a ladder, proceed to the top. And when you reach 100, the game ends. This simple list of six rules will generate all and every possible game of snakes and ladders. What's nice about this type of generative grammar is it not only tells us what not to do, but also gives us a simple set of rules for playing the game from beginning to end. In other words, we could say that this set of rules characterize an entire system and will generate all and only every possible game of snakes and ladders possible. Generative grammar is most often associated with the very famous philosopher and linguist Noam Chomsky. He extended this notion of a generative grammar into describing languages. He said, a grammar is a mental device which produces all and only sentences of the language. By mental device, we mean that the grammar is not written down in a book per se, but is part of what is in your head. So knowledge of language involves a knowledge of the generative grammar of that language. The goal of the discipline of syntax in linguistics is then to build a grammar of a language using a finite set of abstract rules which can then be applied to all other human languages. It is this last part that really sets the generative enterprise apart from others' approaches to grammar. Because the generativists are not just trying to describe one language, such as English, but to produce a grammar of all human languages. Ultimately, syntacticians are part of a broader set of researchers called cognitive scientists, and they aim to study grammar for what it may tell us about how the mind works. 
Language is the mirror of the mind, and a detailed study of language might reveal to us how the mind works, said Chomsky. Key concepts in generative grammar are the notion of grammaticality, some sentences are grammatical, and some sentences are ungrammatical, and all speakers have innate knowledge of a language. So you can ask any speaker of a language if a particular sentence is part of their language or not, and they will be able to give you a grammaticality judgment about whether it is a good sentence in the language or not. Another key concept is universality. The idea is that all human languages have an underlying core grammar, and we call this universal grammar. Although it might not be particularly clear at the moment and may sound rather abstract, over the course of the next few lectures in this module, we will be making it clearer what a simple generative grammar looks like, and we will be developing a simple generative grammar of English. What would some of the core components of a grammar be? Well, we need a lexicon, that is to say, a store of words and morphemes. Morphemes is a technical term, you will come across it in other linguistic modules. More or less, it means the endings and the prefixes of words. So words like picture, wall, house, eating, to run, etc. are all in your mental lexicon. It also includes the endings of words such as uh, eat, eating, eaten, etc. The next core component of a generative grammar must be phrase structure rules. These are basic rules to combine words into structures called phrases. We will be using a simple notation to express these rules. And by the end of the course, you should have an idea of how to write these rules for yourself. We will also need transformational rules. These are rules that change the basic structure. For instance, we might want to move things around, we might want to delete words or insert words, etc. Finally, a core component of a generative grammar will include something called spell out. Spell out is an operation or a system that converts structures into two things. On the one hand, it interprets the structure phonologically, so it converts a syntactic structure into sounds that can be pronounced, or if we happen to be writing, written down. Spell out also interprets the structure semantically and extracts meaning from it. To make this a little less abstract, let's go through an example of what a mini grammar of English might look like. Let's start off with a sentence, the cat sniffed the mouse, this is a simple transitive sentence. There's nothing particularly interesting or exciting about it. It's just one possible example of many sentences we could create in English. If we look at the words the cat and the mouse, we will also see that they are similar in some ways. Both of them start with uh, the word the, which is a determiner, and then both of them are headed by a noun, cat and mouse. And these phrases, the cat and the mouse, refer to entities in the real world, namely a cat and a mouse, respectively. We can also see that we can switch them around in the sentence a little bit. We could say something like, the mouse sniffed the cat, and this tells us that the mouse is a set of words that group together. We're going to call these a phrase, in particular a noun phrase. Similarly, the words the and cat group together, and we're going to also call these a noun phrase. So the cat and the mouse are both noun phrases. Looking back at our original sentence, the cat sniffed the mouse, we could ask a question about it. For instance, I could say, what did the cat do? And the answer might be, sniff the mouse. This tells us that the words sniff the mouse are also grouped together into a phrase, which we are going to call the verb phrase. So the verb phrase is sniff the mouse. With this information, we can create a simple rule that tells us how these phrases are linked together. This notation says that a sentence is into a noun phrase and a verb phrase. Similarly, a verb phrase, like sniff the mouse, can break up into a verb sniffed followed by the mouse. What's interesting about this notation is that we can also draw it in a kind of a tree. So we could take the sentence and say it is broken up into a noun phrase and a verb phrase, and we're going to connect those together with two little lines. Then we can take the verb phrase and say that it is broken up into a verb and a noun phrase, and we can connect those with two little lines, and this creates a simple syntactic tree. Well, you might say, so what? What's the big deal? Let me show you how this simple structure, or this simple grammar, is generative. 
So we could take any other noun phrase in the language, for instance, the child, and put it in the noun phrase position. We could take any other verb, like hold, and we could take any other noun phrase and put it into the final noun phrase position to yield a child told the lie. And we can play this game with as many other noun phrases or verbs as we want. We could generate a chicken crossed the road. Or we could generate something like a frog pondered his future. What is important here is that we have created a very small grammar, arguably with just two rules, and that grammar generates or creates sentences of English. And as long as we could come up with more noun phrases and more verbs, we could probably generate an almost infinite number of English sentences. Where this becomes really powerful really quickly is when we can apply these generative rules to other languages. For instance, this very simple grammar that we've developed for English can also generate a number of sentences for other languages, such as Ndibone amantumbazana amabini, which means I saw two girls in Isikosa. Or we could use it to generate French, such as je mange du pain, which means I eat some bread. Now, obviously, this is not a complete grammar of English, neither is it a complete grammar of French or Isi Osa. There are clearly many subtleties and nuances of all these languages that we would need to include in our grammar before we could justifiably call it a complete grammar. However, even from this rudimentary, very simple and perhaps simplistic grammar, you can see that we can generate a very large, if not an infinite, number of sentences. Over the next couple of lectures, we will be expanding this grammar to be able to generate a much more complex and truly infinite set of English sentences. But before we get into analyzing sentences in too much detail, we first need to be able to work out what are the constituent parts or what are the words that they are made up of. So in our next installment, we'll be looking at how to break up sentences into words and phrases, and how we can provide linguistic evidence for the categorization decisions we make. In other words, how do we know that a noun is a noun and a verb is a verb? All that and more in our next installment.